This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So my name is Janet Tomiyama. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at UCLA and I study stress and eating and I've been just fascinated by all the information I've learned today. Now I'm going to start by having Dina Herman from UCLA introduce herself. She's going to um, bring to us sort of the clinical perspective. Uh, hi, I'm Dina Herman I'm at the UCLA School of Public Health and I'm a pediatric nutritionist by trade but um, have recently, in the last couple of years, started working in the area of the microbiome and childhood obesity. Tell us more about what you're Oh, well, we just have done one pilot study so far, and we're in the middle of um, really analyzing the data. That's how I'll be spending my holiday vacation. Um, <laughs> but uh, it is a study of 100 children, ages 2 to 8. Um, we've done three fecal samples, three quantitative 24-hour dietary recalls, and so it's a, quite a nice um, database looking for diet, not just at the macro, but also at the micronutrient, and also we have phytonutrients and many other components of the diet that I think to date have probably not been investigated in detail. Great. So um, go ahead and raise your hand if you have a question while we're getting the mic out to whoever is first. I just thought I'd take my um, uh, 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 the first question and ask. So throughout the day, I've been having conversations with people in the audience, and they all think this is amazing, but they're all sort of a little bit intimidated with how do I possibly incorporate this into my research. And we've been talking about poop a lot and poopsicles, um, <laughs> but is, aren't there other ways to study the microbiota? Can't we use prebiotics, probiotics? Um, Emran did a little bit of this. Um, what are some of the easy gateway ways to incorporate some of these perspectives into our research? Gateway way. I think you're going to have to bite the bullet and actually do the big data analysis. But, but I think those kinds of manipulations are very, very useful in, in animal models or even in humans to understand the implications of a microbial manipulation via dietary components are live organisms that make it down through the GI tract into the lower GI tract. Uh, but ultimately, I, I think we're going to have to do the, the big data science and, and not just simply look at the composition of these communities, but at their their uh, encoded functional capacity and their actual products that they present to the immune response um, in the human host. And I think that ultimately that related to the bigger picture of clinical outcomes and disease is how we'll understand both variability and heterogeneity within disease, um, um, uh, different diseases, um, and more tailored approaches for specific subsets of patients that have a particular dysbiosis and dysfunction related to their disease symptoms. Yeah, and also to make a comment to this, if I understood the uh, question correctly, I mean, it's not that much easier to do uh, intervention studies because the hurdles that have been put up by the FDA for uh, probiotic interventions are, are equally, if not more challenging than getting a new drug, um, uh, get an IND for, uh, for a new drug. I, I don't know, this always comes up at meetings with probiotics people. Um, it's hard to understand why that is, but um, there's... There's things like milk, uh, human milk oligosaccharides genetically engineered or produced by, by, by bacteria. There's a range of probiotics. Um, so so the, the, uh, the uh, probiotic that Sarcosmus manian is uh, so planning to start a trial in, in autism. And it's, it's just to get this, the IND for that probiotic will take a year and probably a million dollars. So it's, it's very difficult. So this is sequencing it. It's probably the easier way to go. I, I think it's... Well, part, part of the problem is that you can put the probiotic in a food and call it a food and not have that problem, or you can isolate the probiotic, put it in a capsule, and now it's a drug, and you do have that problem because the mm -hmm. FDA has very different uh, 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 rules for whether you uh, are 
dealing with a food or with a drug. Uh, the problem, of course, is if you're doing it in, say, yogurt, um, you have other things that you're adding as well. So, you know, isolating the effect that you're looking for becomes highly problematic. So this will continue to be a, a hotbed of uh, controversy for quite a, quite a while yet. Um, hi. Um, we, we heard evidence on this morning in one of the early talks that the salivary microbiome is, if anything, more um, constant than the gut microbiome, certainly more than the skin microbiome, Are there, and certainly it's easier to collect than, than feces. Are there any data relating the salivary microbiome to the brain or the brain saliva um, network or the psychoneuroimmune um, pathways with cytokines? Would that be a more convenient and reliable target than looking at the gut, in other words? I guess, so, I mean, my... my um, uh, view on this, even though I'm not really, you know, I've not done this, not an expert. I mean, given the the the, the various um, uh, different communities within the mouth, um, you know, on, on the gums and the tongue, um, I'm not sure what salivary is. It's just kind of like stool. It's a mixture probably of of, of of the various, and I'm not sure if that has been studied as as well as um, so within the GI tract, for example. I think the next. The future will definitely be capsules that can sample uh, throughout the gut, so you actually can say, you know, what's going on in the small intestine and in different regions. There's evidence, different regions in the in the colon that may be different, and the mucosa tearing community is different from the. So I, I mean, I, I think with the stool samples, we're just really at the beginning of, of, of that field. I, I don't know. Peter is probably more the expert. Um, yeah, I guess I would say, I mean, there are some diseases like rheumatoid arthritis where there are alterations in the microbiome of multiple body sites. So, you know, in addition to changes in the gut microbiome, there are um, maybe more well-documented changes in the oral microbiome. And that's like, I mean, that would be sort of the dream if, you know, there were, at least for us that are interested in the gut, you know, could we sort of remotely monitor the gut microbiome using, you know, um, oral sampling or skin sampling or, or some other, you know, serum biomarker, um, you know, an easier way to sort of track the microbiome over time. Um, and, you know, the, we don't know whether or not that'll be the case, um, but that's definitely something, you know, multiple labs are really pursuing right now. Well, I mean, what's unique about the gut is, as I've showed you, is really the architecture. It's probably the, the, the organ that's closest, and that's because of its evolution from that initial primitive gut tube of the, um, you know, these marine animals. Um, so all the signaling molecules and communication pathways that are set up between the gut and the brain, um, there's certainly, well, I mean, there's communication pathways and there's taste receptors in the mouth. So there are you know, molecules that potentially, it's the same with the skin, I mean, there's, um, so it's, it's conceivable, I'm, I always use this argument, uh, the gut is the largest surface, it's about the size of the, of a basketball court, and it has, you know, the largest number of immune cells, endocrine cells, and nerve cells, so that would, would probably make it, so there's probably inputs from the other sides as well, but not to the same degree, I, I would think. I don't think Aaron's mic was on, so if you could turn that on. Thanks. Over here. We heard a lot this morning about uh, serious long-term effects of uh, antibiotic assault on immature immune systems. Um, I think there's currently around 69 vaccines that are mandated by the age of three, but uh, vaccination is a word that hasn't been used today, question mark. Um. As a, as a clinician, as well as a scientist, I think some of these things are important to um, take a few steps backward on before um, thinking about how all of these really cutting edge concepts apply to e regular everyday issues like vaccination. So for example, vaccinations don't necessarily alter the, the, the microbial composition of what coats and, and occupies spaces in and on our bodies in the same way that an that a antibiotic does. 
um, when you take it chronically for a chronic infection or if you repetitively take antibiotics throughout your childhood, the, if the impacts of those two things immunologically are different from, from, from one another in, in, in quite significant ways. And while I think that um, it's tempting to think that because there may be impacts that um, alter health and disease related issues due to antibiotic overuse, that those same concepts would apply to other uh, modalities that may alter acutely um, at a given point in time one's immune responsiveness like a vaccine might. Because of course, um, the good that comes from vaccines is different also than the good that comes from overuse of antibiotics. In many cases, antibiotic overuse is not associated with actual resolution of the underlying cause of the, the process for which those antibiotics are being given. For example, taking antibiotics when a virus is actually causing the problem in the first place, which is a misuse of the antibiotic. That's distinct from what happens with vaccines where those vaccines are, are being given for a bona fide purpose, which is preventing um, the prevalence of that disease process in the population as a whole. So um, I think that you know, while attempting to link concepts, and then you know, um, derive uh, inferences from those links that we might logically make. Um, I don't think the data necessarily are there to support a lot of those links yet on the clinical front in this arena relative, relevant to the microbiome. I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to understand those links. Okay, let's yes, I have a question about um, the FDA and not allowing genetically engineered or genetically modified organisms to be identified on the food that is provided for our citizens in this country, let alone the world. And what do you suggest we can do about it uh, if that information's not on the packages of, you know, what we're, maybe we should go back to our victory gardens and grow our own food, I don't know. Do you have an answer? I'll, all right, I'll take that. I, I actually went to law school. I got a master's in law, and specifically for food and public health law, so I'll, I'll take that. At the moment, there are no data, repeat, no data that say that genetically modified foods cause disease. Now, that doesn't mean they don't, and it doesn't mean they do. It means that there's no data. I personally think that it, things should be labeled because if it turns out later on that we find out that there is a link, we won't be able to go back and figure out what happened. So I ha happen to be for labeling. But the food industry has been very, very specific about the fact that if there's no data, then there's no reason for labeling. If you don't like that answer, write your congressman. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to say, like, I think that raises sort of a larger issue uh, that makes me very depressed about nutrition, um, which, is, which is that, you know, in addition to not knowing whether or not there's GMOs in our diet, we usually don't actually know what we're eating. Um, and, you know, it's tempting to believe the labels that are in our supermarket, um, but there's abundant evidence that companies either accidentally or intentionally are mislabeling the food that they're selling. Uh, the most egregious example of this is fish, where uh, people have gone and genetically tested the fish that are being sold in supermarkets, and it turns out that in many cases they're completely the wrong species. Um, and uh, you know, even if it is the right fish, you know, that it might be uh, labeled wild and actually farm raised. And so, you know, we really, uh, you know, the. Uh, Government is very lax in terms of being able to enforce, you know, the content of our diet in general. And so, you know, if, you know, I were president, that would, <laughs> that, that would be sort of, number, you know, high on the list. It's, it's, been, it's, been, it's been estimated that 38% of the foods in the American grocery store are misbranded. That is that something about the label does not actually say what's in the food itself. So this is a major issue. The problem is that the enforcement arm of the FDA is the Department of Justice. Now, they're busy with drones. And they're busy trying to keep, you know, 
Muslims out of the United States. Um, the fact is that uh, this does not rise to the level of the Department of Justice, and the food industry knows it. So they basically have carte blanche to do whatever they want in terms of misbranding. This is a problem that is an enormous problem and is not going to go away. If I could make a side comment to the, to the GM, GMO question. Um, I mean, I'm not sure if there's this possibility of lateral gene transfer at all, a possibility, but I think the, the, the more concerning thing is, 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 is really the fact that the, uh, the pesticides, that are, I mean, the whole reason, we, you know, we have, so, so, so the GMO, GMOs has a lot to do with the ability to, to kill all the, the, the plants that you don't want when you, when you grow the food. The, supposedly, the, the doses that are being used because of development of resistance are several fold higher than they were in the beginning of these pesticides, uh, particularly, you know, Roundup sort of being the most notorious. And I, I've, I've looked into this, so there, there were initial short-term studies about the safety of Roundup and the, the enzyme that's required to make this the active um, uh, toxic agent is not in the human um, body, but, but the microbes have it. So I, I think this is really the, 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 the hidden danger that's not talked about at all that we're getting increasing amounts of, of these pesticides that are affecting the gut microbiome. So that may be more, more uh, a short-term danger than dealing with the, with the genetically modified food and, um, itself. Terrifying. Um, question over here. You were talking about antibiotic re uh, overuse and resistance, and I think I heard one comment at one point today about creating antibiotics that um, can be more targeted. Um, any of you guys know anything about, I, I'm, at this point I'm scared of taking antibiotics and you know, I know there's causes for it and there's reasons, um, but do you guys know anything on the horizon or any work that's being done about creating more, more targeted antibiotics? There's a, a company in, uh, down in Menlo Park that are using phage-based technology to um, very specifically take out species and actually strains of species called avid biotics. Uh, that's a new technology that's that's coming online to really, in a very tailored way, target a very specific organism within the microbiome. And there's a lot of work that they're doing in that that area. Um, beyond that, I'm not sure of anything else that's coming online. It's hard to envision in the on on the clinical front um, that trend rapidly um, emerging and finding its way into the armamentarium of drugs that we give patients for legitimate bacterial infections, uh, only because um, I think there's so much to be gained by widespread, wiser use of antibiotics before we need to even think about the idea of developing actual new drugs from scratch and the money that goes into developing those new drugs. Um, that I don't, I don't know um, if it's going to go in that direction right off the bat because I don't see the drug company funding a head-to-head -head comparison of an effective antibiotic that treats um, life-threatening infections with a similar version that might be as good but is not as widely killing across the wider swath of different species. Um, I just don't see that trial in the offing anytime soon. We only have three minutes left, so raise your hands high, please. <laughs> Yeah. The person with the mic wins. Um, Dr. Mayer, you kind of already answered my question. I was, I was going to ask about glycophosphates, also known as Roundup. Um, I believe the only people that are working on this on the agriculture front might be at UC Davis, Dr. Um, Jonathan Eisen. Can any of you talk a little bit about the, um, the pesticides and some of these chemical treatments that we're, that we're using on our soil and how this is related to food production and the possible transfer of that? Um, toxic chemical into our gut and how that might impact it beyond just glycophosphates. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's a really interesting topic and one that is near and dear to our heart. We're very interested in, you know, not just the normal parts of our diet, but the foreign compounds that we're ingesting, whether or not they're drugs or um, contaminants like pesticides. Um, I think it's important to point out that, you know, this is such an early stage of the field that, you know, most people have been studying um, the expected part of our diet. Um, and, you know, we really know very little about what potential impact, um, you know, pesticides or, or even, you know, other more routinely ingested um, foreign compounds might have on the microbiome. And so as far as I'm aware, you know, we, that hasn't really been looked at. 
what, what has been very well studied for many years is the way in which microbes can detoxify those compounds in the environment. And so, you know, moving forward, I think it'll be very interesting to see whether or not the same sorts of ways that microbes in the soil or in other um, aquatic ecosystems um, detoxify compounds are also present within the microbiome itself. I think Last, just, oh, sorry. just to um, drive home some of the impact of the, the question beyond even the microbiota, um, I believe it's the um, Kaiser Family Foundation when they did an analysis across California of um, nursing mothers found well over 300 different known carcinogenic toxins um, present in the breast milk on average of uh, so-called healthy people. So, you know, we are being bombarded um, by a sea of toxins um, and other chemical substances all the time. And the, 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 the ones we know about that may impact a certain pathway only represent the tip of the iceberg of all the different things that we are actually being, being exposed to, most of which we have no clue what they do. That's terrifying. All right, one last question. <laughs> Take you. Hi. Um, so I read some studies, and I think it was with mice that have been made with some depressive tendencies, and they have different stool microbiota than um, healthy mice. Um, I was just wondering how close we are to kind of mapping out um, different subsets of depression that might be caused, or other psychiatric diseases that might be caused by um, diet or um, a shift in a microbiome, uh, microbiome, and how close we are to maybe thinking about treating those types of psychiatric diseases by shifting the microbiome, or is this like the wrong way of thinking about those types of diseases? Yeah, I, I mean, so I can make a comment on this. Um, so, as I mentioned during my talk, is I mean the the, the animal data are very impressive, um, but you have depression-like behaviors. I, I think you always have to take this with a grain of salt. How that translates to human depression? Uh, same with anxiety. Um, and I, I mean, there are ongoing studies. I'm aware. So you know, Rob showed some data from the American Gut Project, and you saw there was a small. Um, you know, very, a very small effect um, or, or group difference between patients that indicated depression. This is not a um, DSM diagnosis, obviously, from the American Gut Project. Um, I mean, I, I, I think just based on our own experience with, with irritable bowel syndrome, that this, this concept that there are these subsets, some with dysbiosis, others with a completely normal um, 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 microbiome, that same thing probably applies to, to most human brain. Disease, uh, brain disorders uh, in autism. So anytime you look at the data, so in autism there's probably 15 studies that looked at the, the microbiota, and they're all over the place. Some, there's almost no consistency, and I think that indicates the small studies, poorly controlled, not controlled for diet at all, not controlled for sex. Um, um, so I mean, I think we're a long ways away from these large-scale, well-controlled studies that look at these correlations. And then the other problem with that is you don't know what's the chicken and the egg. So, um, you know, many patients with depressions have um, constipation, slow some of them have slow transit. That would inf influence the, the composition of the microbiota. Um, so I, I think it's a very challenging topic. And the reason that there's not more data coming out because it, it takes big, well-designed uh, studies to, to actually demonstrate that. They, they will ultimately come out, I'm sure, and I would not be surprised if there are subsets that, that might benefit from, from that treatment. But. And yeah, I don't know, Emran, if you would agree with us, but uh, I always say to our colleagues that work on autism that, you know, the, the classic sort of things that are measured in mice are, for example, uh, repetitive stereotypical behavior, staying away from large groups, um, uh, you know, and being asocial, basically describe scientists. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and you know, so maybe you know, maybe we should be promoting these interactions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is you know probably one so circus was many and then Elaine Shaw's study um, was is obviously one of the best designed and most elegant studies, but nevertheless, it it's relying on these sort of questionable animal behaviors that. You, very difficult for me, at least. I mean, we've seen it. So I've, I worked in pain for, for for decades, really, and I've seen hundreds of pain models in, in, in animals come and go in, in, in mice. And 
none of them is translated into in, into a new treatment for for uh, for chronic pain. So it's that's for same in stress. We, we thought a few years ago, corticotropin releasing factor antagonists would be the the miracle drug of the the 21st century and works in every animal, including monkeys, but had no effect in, in human trials. So I, I think you have to be really careful how much we translate from these um, media-grabbing publications. Uh, so Janet's going to have the last question. Okay, thanks, Alyssa. <laughs> uh, well, what we wanted to do is have a very brief sort of take-home message on what we can do to improve our, pro our uh, microbiota. In the next session, the poster session, we're going to get free samples of kombucha. Does that work? <laughs> um, also, we'll have samples from our vendors as well. So if you could keep it really brief, like a haiku, if possible, that would be great. Um, let's start. Uh, and we're going to finish at the very end with some closing remarks from Rob. So let's start at the other end. Um, I would say pay your taxes. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. Um, well, maybe a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit more involved um, comment than that um, is just um, uh, as a metabolic researcher who works a lot on mice, um, uh, I would I would hope that um, the next five years or so brings out um, a uh, push for the general research um, public who tries to translate from mouse to human, the generation of mouse models that take into account the contribution of the microbiota and the interaction between the diet and the microbiota in such a way that they become standard practice for uh, mouse researchers to use as opposed to now where you have microbiome researchers that focus on this stuff and everybody else who seems to ignore the contribution of that. Not because they don't want to focus on it, but because I think the tools still are lacking and not as widespread in their availability. So I think that um, that will help develop better translational platforms going forward. Great, Susan. I would say take personal responsibility for your own microbiome. Your own health is in your hands, and diet can be a very strong component of how you promote your own personal health. But do you have any specific diet? Fish and veggies. That's what we do. And not farm fish. Yeah. Well, and I think, as a nutritionist on the panel here, um, we talk about GMOs and these other things, but we rarely talk about eating the whole food. So obviously, we can't rule out all GMOs, but I think um, if we're not eating processed foods, then we're eating whole foods, and we're having a much higher likelihood of eating foods that are going to be good for our microbiome. So. If you guys remember the pyramid, just think about, it's called my plate now. So half of your plate is supposed to be fruits and vegetables, at least a quarter, whole grains, and very little bit of meat. So if anyone, if any, everyone could get closer to that, I think they'd have a much healthier microbiome. Also include nutrition researchers in your <laughs> microbiome work, because we have a perspective to bring to the table. Yeah, so I mean, based on this bidirectional interaction between the brain and the gut, I think you have to um, just confirm what the previous speaker said. Um, mind what, how you farm your microbes in terms of uh, the products you feed them, but also be mindful of what's going on in your brain because that has um, most likely a similar effect on the, the microbes than what, you, than what you eat, particularly the combination of those two. If you don't pay attention to your mind and to your food, I think it's particularly bad. Um, in terms of specific diet recommendation, I personally prefer the Mediterranean diet because I think it has most of the things in it that seem to be um, beneficial and it tastes good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just going to add to that. Um, on December 30th at 9 p.m. on KQED, uh, PBS will be airing Michael Pollan's In Defense of Food. And there's a lot of what's been talked about on this panel in that two-hour video. Everybody set their DVRs, okay? Um, so my, my three words for this is eat real food. It's kind of a take on what uh, uh, Dina just said. We're gonna end with Rob giving us our closing comments, but before we do, will you join me and Garrett giving the panelists a round of applause, please?
Uh, you've been all been sitting here a long time, and you don't need to hear me wax. I, I just want to say um, sort of a compilation of three things that maybe we got out of today. The first, microbiome matters. If for nothing else, we learn that what's happening in our gut and on our skin and in our saliva actually makes a difference, and it's a uh, field of uh, investigation that had basically been ignored until about the year 2000. And it may actually hold uh, uh, genuine uh, uh, treasures in terms of uh, mitigating uh, various diseases that uh, have plagued mankind for a long time. So this, this is a uh, very, very promising uh, line of investigation. Having said that, Number two, we haven't fixed any disease yet because we know about the microbiome. And I think we're going to have a lot of difficulty and a lot of uh, problems in terms of traction, in terms of getting anybody in Washington to care about this until we actually solve at least one disease because of this. Think of it this way. And Christian Vase is here in the uh, audience, and uh, no offense to Christian, Christian studies obesity genetics, and obesity genetics are important, but the metabolic syndrome, obesity, all of the chronic diseases that we investigate today are about 10 to 15, maybe upwards of 20% genetic. That means that 80% of it is environmental, and the question is, what happened to the environment? Lots of things happened. Pollution causes chronic inflammatory disease in, uh, uh, in lungs, which can actually uh, spur on metabolic disease. Changes in our water supply. Various things that have happened to our environment ha are associated with changes in our metabolic profiles. But number three, something you heard from several people on the panel today, and which I will attest to. You can change your microbiome and therefore your risk for a lot of these diseases in a day, maybe even in a meal. We just published a paper that some of you may know about just a month ago where we took children, 43 kids with metabolic syndrome, and changed their diet for 10 days, 10 days, no change in calories, no change in fat, no change in protein, and no change in total carbohydrate. But within carbohydrate, we took the added sugar out and we put starch in. So we did not give them good food. We gave them lousy food. We gave them processed food, but we gave them no added sugar food. And we didn't change their weight on purpose. We kept their weight stable. And within 10 days, every aspect of their metabolic health improved. So you can do something about your risk for disease, and your patients can do something about their risk for disease by changing their environment. Whether or not it's because it changes the microbiome or not, that we don't know yet. Is there a clear and easy way for everyone to solve their microbiome puzzle? Probably not. It'll probably end up being personal microbiome medicine at some point. But the bottom line is, you can fix your, pro uh, your risk for disease right now, this minute, by changing your diet. Because you can alter these metabolic pathways and these microbiome pathways that quickly. That's a message that our patients need to get, that no disease is inevitable. Everything is modulable, and it may be through this mechanism, and we need to do more research to solve that question. Thank you.